Jim, Jim sends his regrets. He'd like to be here in person today, but he's recovering from some uh, dental surgery. So do keep him in your prayers as he uh, feels better um, with medication. He wasn't sure driving was a good idea this morning. Welcome to everybody. Welcome in person and welcome online. If you're joining us for this uh, service, happy Independence Day, 4th of July. Nice to see red, white, and blue. I think almost everybody's wearing red, white, and blue. Very nice. Um, there's a couple announcements. Um, our Bible study group meets on Wednesdays on Zoom at 12 noon. The links are in the epistle or online if you would like to join us for that. And uh, we also have some uh, lovely flowers that uh, Sue Hallback put on the altar here. Uh, tradition at St. Philip's, I believe, is to put flowers on the altar for a birth. And these pink lilies are in thanksgiving for the birth of Aurora Sky Ursini. Is that right? A great granddaughter of Rob and Sue Hallback. So congratulations. Any other announcements? Let's begin. Oh, I should say a couple things uh, housekeeping wise, because it's been long enough since we did an outdoor service that I forgot how everything works. So I thought I'd review it with all of us. Uh, if you need to go to the restroom, we invite you to go through the, the back door of the church there and go through the sanctuary and then into the hallway. Uh, that prevents you from crossing these wires too many times. If you're a reader, please do be careful um, as you cross when it's time for communion uh, we are still only doing the bread we'll have two bread stations at the foot of the steps so you can line up on either side um, for receiving the bread and as you no doubt know we are now in phase three of our re-entry guidelines from the diocese so masks are optional um, and uh, I, John and I are going to wear them when we administer communion but otherwise we will not be uh, at the altar all right, now we can begin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. I shield myself with threefold power by invocation of the Trinity, belief in the threeness, profession of the oneness, in union with the creator of all things. Today I shield myself with the power of Christ's baptism, his hanging and burial, his rising again and his ascension, his descent for the last judgment. Today I shield myself with the loving power of the cherubim, obedience of angels, service of archangels, hope of rising to my reward, prayers of the patriarchs, sayings of the prophets, teachings of the apostles, faith of confessors, deeds of the righteous people. Today I shield myself with power of heaven, light of the sun, brilliance of the moon, splendor of fire, speed of lightning, swiftness of wind, depths of sea, firmness of earth, hardness of rock. Today I shield myself with God's power to direct me, God's strength to uphold me, God's good sense to guide me, God's ear to listen for me, God's speaking to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's path opening before me, God's shield to protect me from the snares of demons, the inducements of my own vices, the proclivities of human nature, and those who wish me evil. I summon these holy powers to come between me and every cruel and merciless power. Christ be my protection today against violence, against illness, against drowning, against mortal wounding, so that I may come peacefully to my ultimate reward. Today I shield myself with threefold power by invocation of the Trinity, belief in the threeness, profession of the oneness in union with the creator of all things. Christ be with you. Let us pray. O God, you have taught us to keep all your commandments by loving you and our neighbor. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit, that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart and united to one another with pure affection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
A reading from the book of Samuel. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Look, we are your bone and flesh. For some time, while Saul was king over us, it was you who led out Israel and brought it in. The Lord said to you, It is you who shall be shepherd of my people Israel, you who shall be ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. David occupied the stronghold and named it the city of David. David built a city all around from the Millo inwards. And David became greater and greater, for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The response from Psalm will be said responsibly. and highly to be praised in the city of our God is his holy hill beautiful and lofty the joy of all the earth is the hill of Zion the very center of the world and the city of the great king God is in her citadels he is known to be her sure refuge behold the kings of the earth assembled and marched forward together they looked and were astounded they retreated and fled in terror. Trembling seized them there. They writhed like a woman in childbirth, like ships of the sea when the east wind shatters them. As we have heard, so we have seen. In the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God has established her forever. We have waited in silence on your loving kindness, O God, in the midst of your temple. Your praise, like your name, O God, reaches to the world's end. Your right hand is full of justice. Let Mount Zion be glad, and the cities of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Make the circuit of Zion walk round about her. Count the number of her towers. Consider well her bulwarks. Examine her strongholds, that you may tell those who come after. This God is our God forever and ever. He shall be our guide forevermore. reading from the letter of Paul to the Corinthians. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too related, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. 
for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to the Lord Christ. Jesus came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astonished. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people, and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went among out about then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. I 
I get to do the sermon with the sun bouncing, bouncing off the top of my head. I love it. Uh, just love it. Um, Father Eric and I were talking earlier today about Independence Day and how it comes right on top of a Sunday and, and how do you put that together? It's like, for me, it's like putting uh, ketchup on cheese. It's like it doesn't quite fit, but I think there is some things that Paul says today that does make it fit. It's Independence Day, or perhaps we might even call it Interdependence Day, if you want to think about it. I always really do like the energy of this day. It's kind of like it's, it's upbeat and, and barbecues and getting together with relatives, at least the ones you like. Sometimes you don't like them. And, of course, I had great expectations because tomorrow, July 5th, is the real holiday this year, and it's also my birthday. So I always got in to go from here into the next one. Where's Sarah here? Sarah Samp here? It's her birthday tomorrow, too. So anyway, so that brought me back with memories with uh, bringing up, being brought up as a kid and remembering July 5, and every July 5, without failure, came the square cake with the American flag on it. And, and the only thing that changed over the years was that they kept adding more candles. Pretty soon you couldn't see the cake. But every year it was the same. My mother couldn't bake that kind of cake, so it came from the local bakery. And uh, that was an interesting phenomenon buying that. And I thought as a kid, you know, there's more candles are going on the cake, but, you know, the cake kind of tastes the same. And then as I got wiser, I kind of put my fingers, you know how you swipe the, the cake and you get something out of it? It's like it doesn't really, it doesn't really swipe. It's kind of crunchy on top. And then as you got underneath on some years, you find out that the cake right underneath the frosting was kind of dry. And the only thing that was really good was the lemon in the, in, in the middle of the cake pieces. And then as I got wiser and I learned some math, I started to figure, I said, let's see, it's the fifth, we're having my birthday cake today and they couldn't have baked it on the 4th, and then they had to sell it, so they probably had it on the shelf since the 1st or the 2nd. It's always old cake. Every single year, it's old cake on my birthday. Well, I kind of I got out of that. The glory was gone, but I matured. But there's always a sweet layer, and I think it's like the stories today. We've heard from Scripture, the old stories are kind of like crunchy, but there's always a sweet layer in the gospel and in the other readings. And we'll, we'll try to do that together today. I'll, I'll try to walk you through it. Today's reading in the Psalm, we read about David becoming a king and eventually establishing the city of Jerusalem. You know, the city, he's bringing everybody together, all the tribes together. He's got everybody together. Economy is booming. They're making money. There's luxury. There's power. There's dominion, actually. And the psalm says, beautiful and lofty, the joy of all the earth is the hill of Zion, the very center of the world, and the city of the great king, David. God is in her citadels and towers. He's known to be her sure refuge, indestructible. There was stability, predictability, without irritability. And thank you, Father Eric, for last week for blowing that all apart. Even the most exquisite cathedral can turn into a parking lot. Perhaps that earthquake disaster of that church, your church, was a foretaste of what was to come. You know things don't last forever. David would lose his focus on God and watch the deterioration of the city. The projected image of stability, predictability, and security was soon to vanish. In the American culture today, we like to project that same image. Stability, predictability, security, unfazed by anybody or anyone in the world, at least until now at least until the coronavirus, at least until the pandemic, and now things don't seem to be quite as secure. The pandemic brought us reality, and then we do things and we think about getting back to normal. Normal. Back to what? What's normal? And what does normal look like? 
And then I ask, are we the children of Israel in the desert who were tempted to say, please let us go back to Egypt. The way of life was familiar. At least there in that place, we had predictability. We had stability. We even felt normal, even though we had no food. We were in bondage and we faced constant death. It felt so normal. If the pandemic has taught us something, it said nothing's predictable, nothing's certain, nothing's clear, nothing is normal. Mask one day, partial mask another, social distancing, how far, how often, which bubble, which vaccine or no vaccines at all, uh, which way do we go? Dr. Fossey? Even the church had seemed to kick us out the door when we watched each other on Zoom, and perhaps that was good. Maybe it was a really good reality check. It may have caused us to question the role of the church in our own lives. As we beg for normalcy in society, we may need to look for a different normalcy in the church. Our desire to return to church, it's been in the past, as it's been in the past, may actually be farther from God than we think. To go back to the church as it has been may only further compound the problems of the world. The pandemic a chance to look at ourselves and how we view the world. It's a reality check. Members today of all denominations are what? Leading the church. The young people are leading the church. They say they're spiritual. They don't need the church. So do we really want to go back to normal? What's going on? What's the new normal need to look like? The church has historically become a vehicle to the next life. You come here because you don't want to go there. You want to go here. And that's kind of the motivation for many people to come. The church really has created in its history an escape plan to get from here to there. And you got to do it right. And so how do you do that in the coronavirus epidemic? Is the virus part of God's plan or simply a tool of Satan? The answer may be found in the historical roots of the church. Some people here really like history. And they've told me that again and again. And some of you probably don't like it. So out of deference to those who like history, I'm going to insert the history, the background on this, of why I'm saying what I'm saying today and how the church has got itself in the problem it's got today. So bear with me. The early church fathers, and it's way, way back to the time of Jesus, holds the view that God was the creator who created everything, upholds everything, participates in everything. The power of the universe was created by the creator, the person who's the living presence of God in all things in people, in plants, in the ocean, in the earth, in the bird, in the animals. Think of St. Francis if you can't get that. And in all things, even to the smallest thing, God is in there. And even though they didn't know about viruses, if they did, they would include viruses in that category that God was in the viruses also. About 325 years ago, after Jesus, the Emperor Constantine called forth a meeting of church leaders, which was held in Nicaea, the Council of Nicaea. He actually, behind the scene, he needed to get soldiers together to form an army, and he was short of people, men, basically. He was short of men, and he needed to get them, and the only real resource was the Christians. So politically, as he's thinking, this isn't a Christian nation, but if I make it a Christian nation and I pay people and put them in power positions in the army, then I will have a huge army that can overtake the world. So he did that and he called the council together. And the problem with calling the council together was that there was two major differences in theological interpretations. Was God actually, Jesus actually God or was Jesus actually a man? So that was the big, big issue. They ended up coming together saying that God was both. And that seemed supposedly to solve the problem. The underlying issue under that is that as soon as Jesus the man became God, 
Jesus no longer was found in the rest of the world. No longer in the plants, no longer in the animals, no longer anywhere. So that gave the right for us to pollute the, pollute the, uh, the, uh, the rivers, for it cut down all the trees, not to take care of the environment because of this split. Everything is in Jesus, nothing is in the rest of the world. So that's the problem we're dealing with today. And the younger people see that. They say, hey, what about the environment? What's, what's going on? What happens with, with global warming? And they're saying nobody's addressing it, and we're not addressing it because the church has split these two apart. The new normal is going to be bringing them back together. The uh, conflict behind even that in the council, it sounds like, well, we just got together and we had a nice little cup of tea and we drank it and we came up with a nice solution. It really wasn't. It was uh, the book by Richard uh, Rubenstein, When Jesus Became God. It reads like a gripping novel. There's crime, there's cover-ups, there's alternative emotives, there's dangerous ambition, power mugging, fear, intimidation, intrigue, backstabbing, conniving, bludgeoning, terrorizing. So we think these little councils are just, you know, uh, just nice little tea parties. They're not. There was a lot of politics going on behind this. But the problem is we, we left it out. One of the words they used, Greek word, was for one substance. Substance uh, with the Father. And the big issue with that is that it was a Greek word, and nobody could find that Greek word in Scripture. So the churches, even though they were brought together, Constantine got his army, the churches kept fighting. So church philosophy with that term created a heaven up here and us down here. So therefore, in order to believe right, we could, so that we could get from here to here. And that's where that all started. Instead of saying Jesus is Christ is here, it's now this type of thing. So we're kind of like working our way up all the way. Christ has always been found both in Jesus and in the rest of creation. With that being so, we really don't have a right to pollute the oceans or the air. We don't have a right to avoid talking about global warming or starvation or nuclear proliferation. All these things affect the body of Christ because everything is the body of Christ as well as Jesus. I had the opportunity this past week to watch fireworks on the, the local lake by my home. It's a yearly event and the community gets together and it's kind of a motley group of people, kind of like this, motley. And there were, uh, out in the ocean, there was uh, three rafts with, you could tell they had uh, explosives on them. And one was really close to the, uh, the shore. Yeah, so they must know what they're doing. And then there's two rafts a little bit out into the water. And I thought, that's, that's not a bad idea. And then I saw the people running around. I thought, wow, these are kind of young people. They don't seem to have a lot of experience like Paul Bozumowski. Um uh, It's just, uh, I don't know what's going to happen, but it, it should be OK. My expectation was that things would be predictable and stable, and everything would go as planned. We'd see the, the lights up in the sky, and then we'd hear the national anthem, and then we would go home. Um, and then as the wind began to blow and as the fireworks began to go off, they started at the ones closest to shore. And of course, needless to say, it was too close to shore. As it went boom, 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 like this, I looked up, not just a little bit, but all the way up and the stuff is flowing down on me. And I thought, oh, new shirt, got to get the sewing out, kit out, you know, it's going to be burn city kind of survived that, and then the other one started to go off, which was not, not too bad. And we saw some, you know, some sparks here and there, some fires, and then I, I looked and I saw what I thought was a red flare in the middle of the lake. And then I looked a little closer and the red flare got bigger. And then the red flare got bigger and bigger, and I said, oh, the raft's on fire, and all the fireworks are out there. And I said, so let's see what the safety plan is before this thing blows. And nothing happens, and then suddenly, in the midst I look out, and there's this little body with this little guy swimming out to the raft with a, with a plastic bucket. And I thought, no, we're going to have a burnt body, and everybody's going to get burnt out of there. What happened was he actually did throw the water, and he actually did quiet the fire. So I kind of calmed down a bit. 
and then I expected, well, there's one raft left. So actually the final, the final, you know, the finale that goes up and you got to get the loud bangs all over the place. That's going to be great. So the little raft that's left shoots up three little sparks and a puff of smoke. And the guy runs out and says, that's it, folks. So, so much for, for thinking about, you know, predictability, what's going to happen. But in those moments, I had a chance to reflect what was going on, at least for me. Um, I looked up, and what I saw was blazing blue. I saw red fire. I saw golden stars. I saw twirlers that went up in the air. And then I looked deeper, and I realized that all of those fireworks supported by air that God created, water that God took care of the sparks and quenched the fire, I looked deeper beyond the fireworks, and I saw a starry sky up there. And I thought, we're doing fireworks, but God's doing everything else. We just miss it because of our perspective. Perhaps that perspective is what the Apostle Paul was talking about when he talks about I had a friend 14 years ago, and uh, I would agree with him. He was up to the third heaven. Maybe that's what they were seeing with the third heaven. And he's able to, uh, to share that with us, and I would call that probably contemplative consciousness, being fully aware of God in everything, being able to see with new eyes, being able to be present and centered, even in the most disturbing, distracting situations. The church prior to 500 years ago made a deliberate effort to foster being present, centering prayer, if you would, so that you could see Christ in everything, not just Jesus. Jesus is okay, that's all there, but in everything else. Contemplative consciousness was embraced by the mystics, contributed to the calm, quiet center of the Christian, always calm and quiet we seem to have lost that experience in the church now it's beginning to reemerge. though the churches are teaching contemplation it's going to be the church's new normal of how to approach the situation i don't have a list of what we're going to do exactly but the consciousness is the new normal and if you want to know more about it you can see paul bozimowski over there or somebody who's in the saturday contemplation group right paul yeah, okay, he'll do that, okay. So it's coming, the new is coming. And despite having the experience and the knowledge of a third heaven, St. Paul was restrained as not to become too proud, and read as arrogant about the experience. Arrogant people aren't believed. They, have you ever realized that? If somebody's arrogant, no matter how truthful it is, you put your fingers in your ears. So Paul took on the appearance of weakness, not being arrogant, so that the power of Christ could come through him. He didn't complain about the weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. He let it go. He sums up this by saying, whenever I am weak, then I am strong, because Christ comes through you. Arrogant people are not heard. It's with that same humility that Jesus sent his disciples out in today's gospel, two by two. Didn't send out a whole flock. And Jesus, Jesus learned his lesson about sending people out by preaching in the synagogue in his town because they didn't hear him. And he says, no longer are we going to get up here on the pulpit like this and tell you what to do. He says, you're going to go out and you're going to go out two by two and you're going to live in their houses. You're going to preach the gospel by meeting people, getting them to know your name anybody on the street. I'm sure you have people every day that you come in contact with you don't know their name. They're in the supermarket, they're in the post office, they're, they're all over. This week, why don't you just reach out and just say, hi, I'm so-and-so, how are you doing? And just ask them how they're doing. And they may give you your name and you may just begin to form a relationship. The real Christian is the one that can be seen in society. They don't have to know you go to St. Philip's, but they, do they say when you walk in, that person's different. 
that person's unusual. What about that person? Oh, a Christian. Oh, and they attend St. Philip's. Oh, I'd be interested in finding out what that's about. So it's the relationship that starts things. So you're to go out with humility, but also Paul says, don't take along, or Jesus says, don't take along extra clothes. Um, one tunic, you got two tunics, it looks like you're rich. Don't do that. Uh, if you got extra bread, it looks like you're really wealthy. If you've got uh, money, uh, people don't need to see that. Uh, don't take along extra bags. Just be yourself. That's what he's saying. Approach other people as themselves. And as a footnote, um, I need to say, and, and I kind of hesitate with this, but I'm going to put it out anyway. Um, if somebody listens to you, that's fine. But if they don't listen to you, you can just let it go. Um, as we read in today's lesson, it'll say, as you leave, simply shake off the dust that's on your feet as a testimony. A testimony, and it says, to them, not against them. You'll read against them. But whoever did the translation didn't look at the Greek because the Greek word says to, not against. And it doesn't make sense that you're preaching the gospel and suddenly when you leave, they didn't listen to you and you go, hey, you. It, that's not the character of Christ. It would be to. It's the dust of the rabbis, the holiness that they're talking about, shaking off, shake off the holiness on somebody else. Say something nice about them. Say, have them have a good day and have God bless them. On this Independence Day, we've got a chance to do something different. We've got a great opportunity to remind ourselves that to live differently than the world around us is what's possible. And also with this world, seeing Christ in everything and everybody. We need to see that. Instead of being independent from one another, it's an opportunity to be interdependent with one another. See Christ in yourself. See Christ in your friends. See Christ in those whom you dislike and in those whom you like. And above all, take time to see the same Christ fully present and living in the air, the water, the sky, the stars, the sun, the moon, the birds, and all living and non-living things, including probably the virus. Blessings in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. join now in saying the creed. Our God is the God of all humans, the God of heaven and earth, the God of sea and rivers, the God of sun and moon, the God of all the heavenly bodies, the God of the lofty mountains, the God of the lowly valleys. Our God is above the heavens, and he is beneath the heavens, heaven and earth and sea and everything that is in them. Such has God for his abode. God inspires all things and gives life to all things. He stands above all things and he stands beneath all things. God has a son who is co-eternal with himself and similar in all respects to himself. And neither is the son younger than the father, nor is the father older than the son. And the Holy Spirit breathes in them. And the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are inseparable. This I believe. The Lord our God listens to the needs of his children. Let us make them known to him now in quiet confidence and hope. The Lord our God listens to the needs of his children. Let us make them known to him now in quiet confidence and hope. We pray for all who work through the power of Christ in the church today, serving the needs of the poor and healing the wounds of injustice, division, and materialism in our society. 
we pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, remembering especially Michael, our presiding bishop, Bonnie, our bishop, Wendell and Stuart, our retired bishops, Eric, Ann, and John, our priests, Lutheran bishops, Elizabeth, Donald, and Craig, our diocesan household, especially St. James and Grozeal, and in the Dominican Republic, Moises, their bishop, and divine providence in Guerra. We pray for the elderly, the sick, and the lonely among us, that they may receive comfort, companionship, and care from those around them. We pray especially for our first responders and those serving in the armed forces, especially Ryan, Trace, Stephanie, Dylan, Matthew, Ian, and Dan, and for those commended to our prayers, especially Dawn, Joanne, Audrey and Dick, Alex, Christy, Renee, Jim, Jane and Matthew, Carl, Andrew, Jerry, Mark and Jill, Walter, Chet, Kathy, Freddie, Carlton, James, Marge, Sarah, Elise, Rose, Sylvia, Chris, Gregory, Karen, Robin, Sue, Rebecca, Jan and Megan, Dean and Martha, Brad, Reese, Erica, Kathy, Shaylee, Jane, Lois, Michelle, Phyllis, Barbara, Deborah, Warren, Gus, George, Harvey, Pam, and those we name now. We pray for the souls of those we love but see no longer. May their souls and their souls of all the faithful departed rest in peace. We pray also for our nation on this Independence Day. Lord, God Almighty, in whose name the founders of this country won liberty for themselves and for us, and lit the torch of freedom for nations then unborn, grant that we and all the people of this land may have grace to maintain our liberties in righteousness and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Remembering our sins and our falling short of the way of Christ Jesus, let us also pray for reconciliation with God and neighbor. O Almighty God, the Heavenly Father, and the only begotten Son, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O Father, O Son, O Holy Spirit, have mercy upon us, O God, the only God, O God of heaven, have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O God, from whom and through whom is the rule of all created things, O God, to whom be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. May the Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. In addition to John's birthday tomorrow and Sarah and Kara listed in the bulletin, any other birthdays or anniversaries this week? Anniversary? And a birthday? How, how, uh, we won't say how many, but we'll, we'll uh, pray for Jana as well. So it's John, Jana, and then Sarah and Kara when we get to that prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, in you we live and move and have our being. Your love gives us life and sustains all of our relationships. Look with favor, we pray, on these your servants as they remember and celebrate all the anniversaries of their lives, including their birth, marriage, ordination, and others. Especially this week, John, Jana, Sarah, and Kara. 
sustain them with your bountiful spirit, and grant them the grace to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart in this life and in the life to come. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. Thank you, O Lord God Almighty. Thank you for the earth and the waters. Thank you for the sky, the air, and the sun. Thank you for all living creatures. Come, O Lord, in the bread of life. Praise be to you, O Lord God Almighty, for our homes, our families, our friends, and loved ones. Praise be to you for all the people around us everywhere in this wounded world. Come, O Lord, in the cup of healing. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, just, and fitting here and everywhere to give you thanks, eternal God, who saved us from everlasting death and the last darkness of hell, and gave mortal matter put together from the liquid mud to your Son and to eternity. You had overcome the chaos and confusion of the beginning and the darkness in which things swam. You gave wonderful forms to the amazed elements. 
the tender world blushed at the fires of the sun, and the rude earth wondered at the rays of the moon. And lest there be no one to adorn the world and wonder at your creation, you created humankind out of the clay and brought it to life in the spirit. Although we were formed in the likeness of your son, we abandoned the commandments of your blessed majesty and were plunged mortal once more into the earth from whence we came and mourned the loss of the eternal comfort of your gift. In your great goodness, you sent the word of salvation from heaven that he should be made flesh by taking a human body to care for the ancient wounds and for all that which the age had lost. Therefore, all the angels with all the saints praise him with unceasing voice, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. As the heavenly creatures resound on high the praise of your glory, your goodness wish that it should be known also to your servants. And this proclamation made in the starry realms to be a gift, not only to be known, but also to be imitated. Therefore, Jesus, the night before he suffered for the salvation of us all, in the midst of his apostles and disciples, took bread in his holy hands, and looking up to you, God the Father Almighty, gave thanks, blessed, and broke it. Then giving it to his disciples, said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this for the life of the age. In like manner, after supper, taking the cup in his hands and looking up to heaven, to you, God the Father Almighty, gave thanks, blessed it, and handed it to his apostles, saying, Take, drink from this, all of you, for this is the cup of my holy blood, of the new and eternal covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me, showing my passion to all, and looking for my coming again. Therefore, most merciful Father, look upon us gathered in the name of Jesus and send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts. Let them be for us his body and blood, holy food and drink for those who believe. We ask through Jesus Christ, your Son, our God and Lord and Savior, who with you, Lord, and the Holy Spirit reigns forever, eternal Godhead to the ages of ages. Amen. As our Savior taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Receive, Lord, we pray, the offerings which we make to you of what you have given us, so that by the power of your grace, these holy mysteries may sanctify our present life and bring us to everlasting joys. Amen. They recognize the Lord in the breaking of the bread. For the bread that we break is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cup which we bless is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ particularly for those who are participating online, we say together the prayer for spiritual communion. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire to offer to you praise and thanksgiving. I remember your death, Lord Christ. I proclaim your resurrection. I await your coming in glory. Since I cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me, in this life and in the life to come. Amen.
the gifts of God for the people of God, holy gifts for holy people. On the body of Let us pray. Grant within us, Lord, the gift of your glory, that against all the evils of this present age, the power of the Eucharist we have received may be our protecting wall. Grant that we may be wakeful at sunrise to begin a new day for you, cheerful at sunset for having done our work for you, thankful at moonrise and under starshine for the beauty of your universe, 
and may we add what little may be in us to your great world. Amen. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of the light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.